For those of you who are um, returning to us after attending earlier talks, I want to welcome you back. And for those of you joining us for the first time, um, my name is Steve Weitzman. I'm the director of the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm delighted that you are joining us um, as we continue with our series focused on Jews, race, and religion. As we absorb the tragic news of yet another shooting uh, that may have been racially motivated, this one targeting Asian Americans, I'm reminded of what originally motivated this series, uh, which is to give us an opportunity to learn just a little bit more so that we can all contribute just a little bit more to the effort to make our world a more inclusive one. That goal is certainly at the heart of the next few sessions of this series, which will be focused on understanding racial diversity within the Jewish community. Before I introduce our speaker um, this afternoon, I just want to make a few practical notes. I want to begin by thanking our co-sponsors, uh, which include Penn's Campaign for Community from the uh, Penn's Vice Provost Office, um, along with the N NSF PIDEA program. I want to thank the Center for Jewish Ethics at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, directed by uh, the center being directed by Dr. Mira Wasserman, um, who is the co-organizer of this series. You'll be seeing her a little bit later. Uh, in this program, and I want to thank the wonderful staff at the CAT Center for Advanced Judaic Studies. For those of you who are new to this series, let me just say a few words about how things are going to unfold. Uh, the program is going to run for a total of an hour. We'll be stopping at 2.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Um, our guest presenter, who I'll introduce in a few moments, will speak for 30 to 35 minutes, and then we will have time for your questions. Um, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions in writing. You can do that during the program um, or after we uh, uh, convene for a discussion. Um, and uh, when this uh, presentation is done, uh, uh, Dr. Wasserman um, will be appearing on the screen um, along with Dr. Ann Albert, who is the Director of Public Programs for the CAT Center, and they will be um, reading from your questions to our guest today. Um, I also want to just say a word or two about the rest of the series. Um, after today, we have four more presentations. The last one is on April 22nd. Um, you know, throughout this whole series, we really would have loved to have been in the room with you so that we can discuss these things face to face. Um, obviously, that is not possible, but we are going to um, extend the very last presentation by half an hour on April 22nd for a panel uh, discussion to kind of reflect on some of the implications and lessons of this whole series. So if, um, if you're joining us on April 22nd, plan for that session to last for 90 minutes. So it is my pleasure now to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Laura Lamonic, um, who is professor in the College of Old Westbury at the State University of New York. Um, Dr. Lamonic is a sociologist who studies immigration in general and Latinx immigration in particular. Um, her research on Latinx immigrants, immigrants in the United States spans issues of race, ethnicity, and religion. And, and as you'll see in a few moments, um, Jewish experience lies at the core of some of her research. Um, she is the author of the recently published book, Kugel and Frijoles, Latino Jews in the United States, uh, which explores how Jews migrating to the US from various places in Latin America fit into the US racial and ethnic categorization or perhaps how they don't fit into that categorization. In the words of one reviewer, quite simply, Laura Lamonic owns the intersection of Jewish and Latino identities. Her book is utterly of the moment and yet also historically astute. So we're really, really pri uh, privileged to have her speak with us now. She'll be speaking on race, class, and privilege, how Latino Jews navigate life in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased um, and excited to be here. So uh, thank you all for coming, for listening, and hopefully for, for, uh, for, for thinking a little bit more in depth about some of, the, uh, some of the issues surrounding race, class, and privilege, particularly among the Jewish community. I have a presentation that I'm going to share with you. So let me start off with this. 
why it's not working. There we go. Um, okay. So I'm just going to start off by telling you a little bit about how I uh, started researching this. Um, the These are just a couple of quotes that occurred to me across my life and some of my respondents. So I, I grew up in a suburb of Boston and uh, we were that funny family that spoke Spanish. This is where people would come over to have uh, uh, their, their Spanish dinners at our house and film us for their Spanish class. And when people found out I was Jewish, they would say, wait, how can, how, how can you be Jewish? Aren't you Latina? But your mom has such a strong accent or your brother's name's Fernando. How can that be? Later, when I moved to, to New York uh, in my 20s, I lived uh, on Avenue C, which at the time uh, was a, uh, dominated by, by a Puerto Rican community. And I would speak Spanish at the, the bodega and they would say, yo, how can a white girl like you speak Spanish so well? And this last one is from a respondent who was in Atlanta and said, and went to synagogue and they said, oh, you're from Venezuela. Are you converting? That's so nice. And I remember growing up and then sort of later throughout my life, always thinking like, how is it that these people don't know that, you know, there are Jews all over the world. And probably my Jewish grandparents came from the very same shtetl or similar shtetls to your Jewish grandparents. Um, but it also raised a lot of questions of identity, of ethnicity, of how do I get to choose? Who gets to choose for me? And what does it mean to be Argentine and Latin and Jewish? And at what point do I get a stay in these ethnicities? And then at what point do other people place me in these ethnicities? So it wasn't really until many years later when I got to graduate school that I got, found the language to ask the right sorts of questions. And I began doing research to find out if other people had the same experiences. And this really led me to, to, to see the experience of Latin American Jewish immigrants in the United States as a sort of lens for how we think about race, how we think about ethno-religion, community construction, how we think about Latinos in the United States and what that really means for immigrants, immigrants and life chances, immigrants and upward mobility, so I interviewed 85 people, all first generation immigrants here in the United States from, um, from places like uh, from Mexico, Argentina, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Colombia, among others. And you will have to excuse me. Oh, here we go. Okay. So the, the story of Latin American Jewish immigrants or Latino uh, Jews in the United States is really a story of immigrant assimilation. So immigrants assimilate through socioeconomic advances, through language acquisition, through what we call acculturation. But, and what this group tells us really well, is that immigrants, immigration and assimilation inevitably involves change in ethnic identity and how groups and individuals identify in terms of their ethnic culture, their ethno-religious culture. And I wanted to know, well, what options do immigrants have, right? Do they get to choose? How do immigrants choose or get assigned to an ethnic group, right? People don't come from Mexico and are, and are automatically Latino or Latinx. Mexicans are Mexicans in Mexico and they become Latino as part of the migration process. Well, the same thing happens for Latino Jews, right? But at some point, there is there are options for them because they're also Jewish. They might be Venezuelan or Mexican or Colombian. Now they have a new identity as Latino. And I wanted to know, does a pan-ethnic, in other words, does a new group emerge? Is there a point at which they are Latino Jews? And how does that happen? So I just want to give you a little bit of background of, of um, Jewish life in Latin America and how Jewish communities were constructed in Latin America and in part why this is important. Our sense of identity, of social identity, of ethnic identity, of who we are as a community and as individuals has very much to do with the, the, where our community is found and how we relate to others. So what happens in Latin America is in many ways a story about how ethnic communities are constructed differently than how Jewish ethnic communities are constructed in other places. So Jewish migration to Latin America was the result of a myriad of political and economic crises in Eastern Europe and North Africa, um, in the Arab countries, and 
push factors, what led people to leave their home countries at the time were very similar to what led people uh, uh, to leave their home countries and come to the United States. At some point, the doors closed at around, in around 19, in the 1920s, 1924 to be exact, the doors to the United States pretty much closed to new immigrants at the time. And Jews went to Latin America because it was the best thing or the next best thing or where they could get to. But what they found there was quite different than what they found in the United States. Um, I do want to point out that this photograph is old, is, is pre-1920s, and it's a photograph of, of what we call a, a, a La Colonia de Baron Hirsch. So these were colonies in the north of, of um, of our, and, uh, in the rural areas of Argentina, where uh, Baron Hirsch gave money for, for new Jewish communities. And one of the things that happened is that Jewish uh, communities sort of mythicize, or there's a mythology surrounding the construction of communities. And one of the ways that this happens in Argentina is that Jews were kind of real gauchos. And this is the, what they're wearing are what gauchos, sort of what we call the Argentine cowboy was our way, a war. In many ways, these communities uh, are part of the larger Argentine mythology as true Argentines, but they didn't last very long. And over time, most of the Jewish communities uh, in Argentina, um, move, most of the people moved to, to, to the larger urban centers, much the same way it happens in the United States, where the birth of the large Jewish communities took place in urban centers. But to get back to the general construction of Jewish communities in Latin America, they uh, they Jews found themselves in countries with deep ties to Catholicism um, and deep ties to Spanish colonial rule. They also found themselves in communities where this nation state never provided the kinds of social and public services that we have come to expect here in the United States. So on the one hand, Jews come to Latin America, build strong communities, strong social networks. They operate under what we call a kehila model, where there's a sort of umbrella institution where all other Jewish organizations uh, fall under. And at the same time, they are over time while they, ach they achieve upward mobility, but they have very strong ethno and cultural institutions. And the reason for that is that the state doesn't provide things like great public education, great, uh, there's no little league, let's say, there aren't great public arts institutions. So they tend to be concentrated uh, within ethnic groups. And for the Jewish case, it's remained in ethno-religious organizations that provide these things. So why is that important? Well, that's important because there are many ways to be Jewish in, in Latin America without being religiously Jewish. The synagogues are not the center of life. And I show this picture here because soccer in, our, in Latin America is of utmost importance. It's how people, uh, uh, pe it, it's, it's how people's national identities, even neighborhood identities, ethnic identities are formed. So this is a picture of the Argentine women's Ibraica soccer team in front of the Western wall. This photograph here, is a kosher taqueria in Mexico City, Klein's taqueria. And I show these photographs to, to show uh, uh, evidence of a strong national influence on Jewish culture. So Jewish culture, Jewish communities are not in a bubble. They're strong, they have strong social networks. They are likely to have strong ethno and Jewish ethno-cultural affiliations. At the same time, there's strong national influences, which means that they are absolutely identified as Argentine, as Mexican, as Venezuelan, while being Jewish. Uh, in the United States, though, we know that religious pluralism was a norm that's enshrined in the, in the Constitution. And Jews over time became uh, centered their identity on on religious institutions and not ethnic institutions. Now this happened for a myriad of reasons. Um, in large part, the existing, ra existing racial structure and inherent racism in the in, in systemic and structural racism in the United States has uh, cemented in many ways Jew uh, the, the, the transference of Jews to the other side of the black white binary. 
but Jews also pushed for this. So the way in many ways, so ethnicity lost an edge, Jewishness became sort of some part of what we think about as Jewish nostalgia, Jewish values are part of larger American liberal values. Jews uh, moved to the suburbs uh, in, in, uh, with the help of um, the GI Bill um, through, through their own European privilege, that, pri that privilege uh, home ownership in the suburbs for white Europeans. And in this way, Jewish life sort of lost its otherness, right? Um, and just like when I was talking about Jewish life in Latin America being centered around institutions and organizations, Jewish life in the United States doesn't necessarily need those kinds of institutions because you know what? The suburban public school is pretty good and this is why people move to the suburbs and you don't need your JCC soccer team or your Jewish cultural soccer team because the town soccer is good and the town travel soccer is even better. And here, so therefore these public goods that are provided by the state renders Jews in large part, part of the larger mainstream. But I, so I wanted to find out, okay, so how, what happens? What happens when Jewish Latin Americans come here and they have very strong Jewish identities, they also have strong national identities, how do they identify? So as I mentioned before, unlike uh, Latin America, being Jewish in the United States, uh, it, unlike in Latin America, synagogues are really at the center of Jewish life in the United States, even for those that, are, that, that don't have high levels of religiosity. And I don't know how well you can see this quote, but, it, but it go, this woman goes on to say that most Argentines don't go to synagogue to pray, or I don't even remember going to. And in large part, this has to do with the fact that uh, you can be Jewish in so many ways. People would say to me, my whole life is Jewish and I never go to synagogue. I never go to the temple. Um, maybe I went for my bar mitzvah. Uh, and she, this woman goes on to say, there's a JCC and, and it fulfills some of the same functions, but it's not really the same, right? So in many ways, people are absolutely Jewish, um, but it's not their kind of Jewish. Yet, and this is where being Jewish and the whiteness associated with being Jewish is important, right? So one, uh, one person said to me, you know, I'm not one of those people that takes advantage, but I do use these identities as leverage. So, and then he goes on to talk about being Latino and then being Jewish can bring you closer to people. It allows you to have a better relationship. Being Jewish, especially in New York, opens more doors for you. So I sort of went on to ask people about that. What does that mean? And in one way, being Jewish felt like a way to become an insider, right? It grants you insider status in the areas where Jewish Latinos tend to move to, to uh, immigrate to, right? In large urban areas. So in New York, in, in Boston, in California, in Miami, in these areas with existing large Jewish populations. Um, and they're also, uh, what they're also doing is by signaling their Jewishness, right? They're strategically distinct, distancing themselves from, the, from racialized Latinos. So in essence, they're saying, oh, yes, I'm Mexican, but I'm Jewish. So therefore I'm different and I'm white, right? So I, I think it's important to note that immigrants are much more likely to openly talk about race in large part because they're, immigrants, right? They're newcomers. So they, they, they see the racial landscape and navigate the racial landscapes in ways that will, uh, that will, that, that will reflect or that will support their upward mobility. Um, in addition, what I found was that being Jewish was a kind of what I call ethnic capital. So what do I mean by that? We talk a lot of, sociologists talk a lot about social capital, uh, uh, cultural capital or social capital. So social capital is a sort of networks, who you know, right? Um, are you in part of a larger network? And how does this network exchange information, exchange goods? It's part of thinking about sort of like a treasure, right? That you can dig into at some points. Well, I found that being Jewish is a type of ethnic capital, right? It signals to somebody, we have something in common. You can trust me 
right? Because, uh, because I'm Jewish, you're Jewish. So likely we, we can think that it, it acts as a conduit for trust. And, and this, this is not so new. We, um, Max Weber wrote about this many, many years ago when he talked about the Protestant ethic and this idea of, of being seen as trustworthy because you are of a certain group. So in many ways, this idea of ethnic Jewish ethnic capital is based on an assumed shared norms and, 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 re and reciprocity and a shared set of values, which might be real or might be imagined. But nonetheless, it becomes real because it works as a conduit for trust. So in many ways, Jews, Jewish Latinos or Latino Jews um, absolutely identify as Jewish in large part because of their, their strong Jewish identity in Latin America. Also because they're, they, um, have a, you know strong Jewish history? They they many of them went to Jewish day schools. Latin America has uh, the highest uh, percentage of, of children that attend Jewish day school, um, and this is also in many ways where they feel at home, even if it's not their kind of Jewish. At the same time, there's a strong Latina identity, a Latinx identity. In large part, it, it, it comes from some of the shared cultural norms. It comes from material culture, right? Music food, um, art, literature, and not, and, and not necessarily all highbrow kind of stuff, right? They listen to the same radio stations as non-Jewish Latinos. Um, as Ana is, is a Mexican Jew living in New York, and she said to me, you know, people are more likely to see me as Latina. It's more obvious. Um, and she, then she goes, I feel more Mexican than Latina, right? Uh, but in the United States, to be Mexican is to be Latina. So this is something that a lot of the Latina Jews grappled with, right? Um, Amanda, this is a great quote. So she goes on to say, I have a Latina identity and the language and the values. And then she writes, how I see the mystery of life, everything, even how I laugh. And she ends the quote, which I don't have here, that says, even how I die is intrinsically Latin, right? So this is this, this, this very important notion of values of culture, of non-material culture, of way of being, of shared norms with Latinos that is different from the, what Latino Jews perceived as their shared norms with non-Latino Jews. Yet at the same time, uh, they might have a Latino identity. And as this woman says, I have a Latino identity through language, food. I chose to work in a Latino health, mental health clinic. Um, I feel a connection through with my patients. Uh, my, and, and, but, but then she goes on to say, but I am different from the typical Latino in the United States. I've never had problems with my legal status. I have a different socioeconomic background. Oh, I don't know how to get that back. Um, my last name is different. I speak English. I do not suffer discrimination. So what does this mean? In many ways, it means that they don't suffer discrimination in the same way because they're not racialized in the same way. So even though the census classifies Latinos as anyone who was born in any Latin American country, a Spanish speaking country, so uh, of any race. So the first question in the census is, uh, asks you to fill out a race, one or more racial groups. Then there's an additional question asking, are you Hispanic or Latino? But nonetheless, what ends up happening over time is that we racialize Latinos. There, we sort of collapse categories. Uh, I, I do this also for studies that I publish. Um, and, and we begin as a society to think about Latinos in racial terms. So that means that for many Latin, uh, Latin American Jews, they don't necessarily fit in, even among those that are not uh, of Ashkenazi origin, right? Um, in large part, this has to do with class, right? So uh, Diana said to me, based on what you hear in the news, the connotation of being Latino in the United States is related to lower standards. Um, it is not a positive connection. And Latino Jews very much want to signal that they are middle, upper middle class, that they're well educated, that they are, they don't necessarily want to be grouped in with a class uh, of 
that of uh, with a uh, racialized ethnic group that is viewed as having uh, less positive attributes within the society. And then we need to think a little bit about race. And I think what often happens is that race, particularly among, among Jews, is sort of the elephant in the room. Um, there are absolutely a diverse, Jews are diverse in language, in, in, in ethnic background, in country of birth, in, in parents' country of origin, in religiosity, and in race. Yet the majority of Jews are phenotypically white and resemble the white uh, mainstream. So what Gustavo says, you know, people never think I'm Latino, I'm too white. I think that in this country, it's all about skin color. Uh, if you are white and you're accepted, you are fine. But Blacks face strong discrimination. And I think this statement is important because what Gustavo is saying is, I'm okay in terms of how I'm treated because I'm white. And when I, when, when I asked in the beginning about ethnic options, who gets to choose? In many ways, Latino Jews get to choose because they fen they're phenotypically more like the white mainstream. Black Jews don't necessarily get to choose, right? Asian, Jew Asian, Asian Jews don't necessarily get to choose. Uh, Venezuelan Jews, uh, of even of, of, uh, of Sephardic, of Ashkenazi descent, likely gets to choose much more so than other uh, Jews of color. And what this means that in many ways, it's a costless identity. Right, a Latino identity for Latino Jews is a costless identity. Um, it's they're able to use their their ethnicity, and it can often be strategic or instrumental. So sometimes that just means be getting better services at, at a restaurant because you communicate in Spanish and you have something in common, and you're seen as a, a Latino insider. Um, they might they also benefit from affirmative action oftentimes so in in workplaces in school settings that uh actively promote more diverse uh a, a more diverse uh a workforce or or students mexican jews absolutely check off the box and even some of them you know that i i would say that m most of them would absolutely say well you know, uh, if it's going to help me, I will, I'm going to check off Latino. But then it becomes a costless identity in many ways, because is this really, first we can think about, is this really who affirmative action, um, are the policies of affirmative action set out to help folks like Latino Jews? Um, and they likely, are, are, they, are they likely taking a spot away from somebody that has faced other kinds of hardships, right? But we can also think about it, maybe we can talk a little bit about this, this in the discussion, who does affirmative action set out to help um, and who does it really uh, help? Does it really level the playing field? There is a, a absolutely access to jobs, to grants. So a number of folks that worked in the arts, for example, were able to access grants because of their Latino identity. Um, and then there's a celebration of ethnicity in many ways uh, that happens as a result of a celebration of, of, uh, of, of multiculturalism, which we didn't see in the last eight years, but I argue we'll begin to see it again with the new administration. Uh, so there is, here's, here's uh, Benjamin here who tells me, I differ what I check off on forms in the census, um, but uh, there, there is an advantage to being Latino under affirmative action. Fernando also says, I check off Hispanic because I think I will have more probabilities of getting a job. Um, so, and then this, this last one says, I always made fun of affirmative action, yet it makes me, it, it, I feel that if it, it, if it gives me an advantage, being Latino gives me an edge. Uh, and so I want to point out that all new immigrants to some extent uh, reap some value from this post-civil rights climate, right? And by new immigrants, I mean post-1965 immigrants. 1965 was a sort of pivotal year in immigration where the Hart-Seller Act 
revamped the, the immigration law, uh, laws and, and, and essentially opened up the doors and this the huge influx of new immigrants that we see today, this sort of second wave of large immigrants happened then. So all of the new immigrants to some extent privileged from the fights of the civil rights era that they weren't necessarily a part of, right? Um, and, and they also in these urban areas are likely to be in a climate where diversity is tolerated and sometimes celebrated. Um, and overall, it's more welcoming for Latinos and for Jews, it has been more welcoming. Now, I, I don't want to discount the experience of, of being Jewish and Latino or being Jewish in other parts of the country where Jewish life and Jewish uh, communities are not so entrenched and are not so accepted, but the majority of these immigrants absolutely come to uh, uh, have the experience of being in areas where their Jewishness and their white Latino-ness is tolerated. Um, so Latino Jews are particularly well positioned to benefit from, from all of the changes that have occurred politically since 1965. And they do so, right? They absolutely fit themselves into areas and navigate the racial landscape in ways that benefit them and their families for those that have uh, that are that are here with their families, um, and in ways that will assure or help their life chances and their uh, prospects for upward mobility. So, what does this mean? Um, one of the things that I didn't talk about, and I, and I, uh, but but is a big part of my research, is the construction of new groups, right? A, a Jewish Latino uh, pan ethnic group, where uh, Latino Jews are form larger uh, a larger ethno religious religious groups where there's where we see more pairing off so let's say a Mexican Jew and an Argentine Jew and uh, and we, we begin to sort of see the formation of a new pan-ethnic culture taking place and that's absolutely happened and in large part it's happened because Latino Jews don't necessarily feel like they belong with the American Jewish community. Um, they don't feel like they belong 100% within a Mexican or a Latino or an Argentine community, um, both uh, for, for differences of race and class and religion. And when there is support for the construction of, of uh, larger pan-ethnic groups, that happens. And it doesn't, it, it happens in large part with, with with institutional support, or it happens in, uh, with, within a certain structures like Miami, where folks have the opportunity to meet, to interact, to attend similar institutions, and create a real sense of new pan ethnic group. What will happen? Well, the, the big question then that remains is how does this change, right, the, the Jewish community and how we think about the Jewish community? Um, how does this change how we think about Latinos? And then the sort of third larger question is, is this a, what will happen with the, the children of these immigrants, right? Is this, is, is, the, is this primarily a first generation kind of problem? And will the children seamlessly sort of assimilate into a Jewish American life? Or will they, will, will they keep, uh, new, will they keep constructing and reinforcing new these new pan-ethnic communities? Um, or will many of them not have a Jewish identity at all and become sort of part of a larger white Latino group? So I hope I've left you for some food for thought and I'm looking forward to all of your questions. Um, thank you. And in order to not go over, I'm going to stay under. Um, so thank you very, very much. I want to thank you so much for um, for a great presentation, uh, Professor Lumanic. And um, you left us with a lot of time for questions and a lot of curiosity.
um, that, that uh, we'd like to engage you around. So I'm going to start us off. Uh, and then Dr. Albert is going to um, bring you some further questions that um, come from uh, the listeners in, in the Q&A. Um, but I, I wonder if you can start by engaging um, racial diversity within the Jewish Latinx community. It sure. seemed like most of your, like mo most of the quotes that we got were from folks who um, easily inhabited whiteness. Let say. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if you can speak to, is that, is that true across the board? And um, then sort of a follow-up question is, um, yeah, I guess my bigger question is how does race figure in to Jewish Latino identities? Sure. So I, um, I think one thing that I think is important to note is that my study was, was a study on immigrants. So I, I didn't, interview, um, for example, the, the Jewish Latinos that, that are here in the United States pre-1965 um, are often, uh, there's Cubans, um, but most of them are often um, uh, Jews that, that uh, are uh, offspring of mixed marriages. Uh, and I was really interested in understanding really in the, how larger structural forces create certain kinds of communities and identities. Um, so that was, so I, I do want to point that out. Now I interviewed, uh, to another thing that I want to point out is that a lot of folks will say, oh, well, Latin American Jews are, you know, you must be Sephardic. Um, and uh, while there is that, while there is, there are strong Sephardic and Mizrahi communities in Latin America, um, 85% of Latin American Jews are Ashkenazi, which means that in general, my sample was also largely 85% Ashkenazi. As a result, most people saw themselves as white. But even, or, uh, um, but what I think is really important to point out is why they, they see them, they'll talk about their whiteness or their, their non, uh, their 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 whiteness or their resemblance to the to the white racial mainstream. When I asked I asked all of my respondents, "What do you fill out on the census?" and every single one of them said, "Oh, I don't know." Um, I or I said, "Well, let's say you had to fill that something out," and they'd say, "Well, I'm, you know, European or I'm Jewish or I'm of Jewish descent." Um, so they don't necessarily see themselves as part of the larger white American mainstream, but they're positioning themselves within the white mainstream. Does that make sense? So they're absolutely privileging and accessing this privilege, even if they're not necessarily checking something off on the census that says, oh, I'm white. And I, and, and I think that this is not uncommon I'm, I'm doing another study on something completely different now, but what has become, what was so interesting is that I ask everyone their race and I, maybe out of 800 people, 60 have said other. So when I look at the other, the majority say they're Jewish. So th this is not something that has to do strictly with, with Latino Jews, right? Jews see themselves perhaps as other even if they privilege from this intrinsic inherent whiteness. Thank you. I, I have one follow up because you did um, you did reflect on uh, the atmosphere of the last over the last administration with a lot of anti-immigrant rising racism, rising anti-Semitism. And I wonder if you have a sense in your research of how the how um, how the sort of general suspicion of immigrants, what's happening at the southern border around Trump's wall, um, has, has that affected the way uh, Latino Jews identify? Do you see rising solidarity with, uh, with mm -hmm. other Latino folks, with other immigrants through this period? So I think this is a really interesting question. And I thought I, I, when, when I was doing my research, um, there was a big, was the sort of height of the uh, dreamers, 
mobilization and the DACA mobilization. So one of my questions was, do you, um, how, do, how do you think America should think about its immigration policy? And it, it probably around 80% at least absolutely um, felt that immigrants should have uh, a legal pathway, that they should be treated well. Some of them went to rallies, um, but they still didn't see themselves as part of that migration stream, right? They're, in many ways, their, their support comes from these sort of the same liberal democratic values that a lot of American Jews support, not all. Um, but I do want to point out that one of the things that I have found interesting is that, uh, uh, you know, where what context has a lot to do with this. And what's happening over time is that I'm in, I mentioned earlier before that right now I'm in South Florida, I'm in Miami. And one of the things that has been happening over time is that um, there has been a larger influx of Venezuelans and uh, uh, the Republican party has also made a lot of inroads with Latinos particularly in these areas. So perhaps folks that necessarily wouldn't have either support of these values or anti-immigrant values are more likely to support them now. And, and what I've seen, for example, is people from the same social backgrounds, the same networks in their home countries coming to the United States, settling in two different areas, and then taking on different political views given where they're living, which I think is happening a lot. Thank you. And I'm gonna let Dr. Albert share some of the many questions that have come through to us through the Q&A. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, I was, um, I think the place that I wanna start um, in organizing the indeed very many, we have dozens of questions already, um, is to follow up on the first question that Dr. Wasserman asked in thinking about differences within the category of um, Latino Jews. And so a number of people had asked about differences um, between, for example, Sephardi and Ashkenazi Jews, how they affiliate and how they're perceived. And you touched on that. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. it. Um, people have also asked about differences in class or in economic status. And have you found that, um, that those factors make a significant difference in the way that people choose to identify once they're in the United States? Mm -hmm. um, sure. So, um, you know, there's, I think, an, an interest or, or one of the points that I, I didn't have time to sort of go into was this, the idea of levels of religiosity. Um, so that, and, um, and in many ways, the higher levels of religiosity uh, are an important determinant of how you're going to identify. So oftentimes we find that Sephardic Jews in Latin America tend to be more religious than Ashkenazi Jews. As a result, their Jewish identity is much stronger and they're much more likely to have strong affiliations with the synagogues, with stronger religious communities. So that's absolutely one of the things that happens. Um, and they're likely to be Sephardic synagogues if, they, if, if that's available, but that's not always available. Um, sometimes it's Chabad, um, which, uh, which, which now is a very immigrant friendly and uh, is, is very appealing to both Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews for different reasons. Um, and one of the things that happens in Latin America, though that's changing, is that there are strong what sub-ethnic groups, right? These sub-Ashkenazi groups, Sephardic groups, and we, even within, right? The, there's, there's strong, in, in Mexico in particular, Syrian Jews have strong communities, um, uh, uh, you know, Tur Turkish Jews from different parts of Turkey have strong communities. I mean, they're, and, and, uh, and they're, they've been able to, to, to somewhat maintain strong sub-ethnic groups, but that's absolutely changing over time. So it used to be in Latin America that if you were to, in intermarriage was really marrying outside your sub-ethnic group. If a Sephardic and an Ashkenazi married, it was like, oh my God, you know, um, th th this, this, this is, I mean, you know, they're, they're bringing down a shame on my family kind of thing. Um, and that over time has 
become less likely. So a lot of the, my respondents had one Sephardic parent and one Ashkenazi parent. So this is, um, and in large part, this happens because remember when I talked a little bit about institutions. So one of the things that larger Jewish ethno-religious institutions did was it, it, it created larger pan-ethnic communities within the Jewish community. So whereas perhaps uh, these sub-ethnic groups had their own smaller institutions, over time, they belong to the larger uh, you know, Jewish cultural and athletic association. I mean, this happens in Mexico, for example. There's one big one in, in Venezuela. There's one big one in Argentina. There, there, there's more. Um, so you have more of a choice, but people begin to mix more. So, so while there's absolutely more, more, uh, I, I, I call them sort of like the, the borders are, are, are less porous. Um, I think that's changing over time. Your second question was about class. You know, often people. Often, a lot of the questions I get is, well, what do you mean all, all of the Latino Jews that come here are middle and upper middle class? Well, one of the things that 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 Jews, uh, we, we know that migration um, and those that immigrants are never the poorest of the poor. And this is particularly true in this situation because uh, when without resources to migrate to the United States, Jews can migrate to Israel. So what we have is a sort of self-selection of Jews that come here. Um, if you if they're if they don't have resources to come, and by um, they 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 will often um, go to Israel where where they're they're given all the resources that they need at least initially um, to to settle and to leave their country. So that's that's why we have this sort of self-selected group. That doesn't mean that they're all super wealthy. It doesn't mean that they, many of them experience some sort of downward mobility here um, for a variety of reasons. And many of them come after economic crises. So they were perhaps once of a certain class experienced some downward mobility, but have been able to come to the United States. Not all of them have legal status when they come, but they're able to attain legal status over time. The synagogues, for example, have played a large role in that. That's actually uh, another question that we have um, in the in the Q and A is a follow up on that. Really, is asking about um, whether there is a difference in either access to immigration in the first place or um, a difference in being able to move through the immigration system and eventually mm -hmm. obtain citizenship and and um, American stability among. Jews, Jews from Central and South America versus other people coming from Central and South America. So are, mm -hmm. are you, is there a difference either in, um, it, in governmental policy or in sort of softer forms of, of mm -hmm. reception and access? Sure. Yeah, Jew, Latino Jews are not crossing the border um, by foot. I mean, that's, that's the first, right? They're, they're not part of this larger Latino movement of caravans coming into the United States. Again, in large part, because if that's what they had to do, they would go to Israel. Um, so that, that, you know, that, that they're not going to risk their or their family's lives if they don't have to, and they don't have to. Um, so some of the ways that they come over, um, many have come over with, for, for some sort of schooling and then they are able to then translate that into visas, which then gets translated into, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, longer term visas to eventually uh, green cards or, or permanent residency. Um, for those that have a, a lot of uh, a wealth, there is investor visas. Um, there's absolutely some, you know, what, what Trump called chain migration, but, um, but, but what, uh, what is actually called family reunification. Um, some of that absolutely happens. Um, a, a fair number of people uh, get in through the green card lottery, believe it or not, um, because it's actually not a real lottery. Um, so, um, and what happened in 1965 in large part when the doors opened is that there were there, there's um, there there are um, preferences for certain professions. So what happens is that many we have a lot of, for example, people in the medical field, um, and uh, and they decided to you know come here in large part because 
it, for, you know, for a myriad of reasons, right? Um, but but it, but it's 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 not that hard to get a visa to the United States if you're a doctor. It's not that hard to get a visa to the United States if you're a lawyer. You don't have to go back to law school. You can do a year of LLM, and now you can practice here. So these are, and and I and I talked about ethnic capital a little bit, right? And I talked about social capital. So who you know and 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 what that means. And this and and who you know is is not a, it's not just about networks, but it's also about information. And uh, and one of the ways that the Jewish communities are um, uh, are one of the ways that they reinforce their strength is through sharing information. So there's they're, they're they're not huge communities, and this kind of information gets shared, right? So um, you know how to get to the United States. What are the best ways to get visas? Where you know what 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 do I need to study? What's the most successful way? And the other way that happens is that folks that have that can hire people often do and might sponsor them. And in, in, in the South Florida area, for example, synagogues did this for many of the Argentine Jews, for example, that came over after the economic crisis of, of uh, 2000, 2001, 2000, 2001, 2001. Um, okay, so I have at least four more sort of general topics that I wanna to try to fit into the next 10 minutes. Um, but one quick quick follow up on um, what we're talking about here um, connects up, I think, with your comments about affirmative action, which a number of people have asked about in various ways. Um, one person asked if um, if it might make sense to think about the experiences of Latinos who can pass as white as being similar to that of um, what's often called model minorities. So, for example, mm -hmm. highly educated uh, South and East Asians or or other people like that. Is that a comparison that you that you think makes some sense, or is there are there differences that you would want to point out there? No, I think that's that's that that absolutely is is a uh, is an important comparison. I would also add that um, we often find uh, that there are a number of African immigrants that come from privileged situations that uh, in many ways, um, you know, institutions sort of cream, uh, you know, that makes us uncomfortable to think that, but institutions really, um, uh, what happens during affirmative action is that they want the best um, out of the pool that they have. And, um, and a Mexican Jew might be very well educated and they will also be adding some sort of diversity. Um, and some people were uncomfortable with it, absolutely. Um, I, there was one woman that, that, was, that is, a, uh, is a, a professor and she said, you know, they always want me to put Latina because it will help with our grants and I, I just feel a little uncomfortable. But there are other people that say to me, you know, um, I don't get counted as a real Latina, but somebody else who grew up who was white and Puerto Rican and not Jewish and grew up very affluent will, uh, you know, will get hired as the minority candidate kind of thing. Um, so, so I think what really needs, well, th this is beyond this group of immigrants or really any immigrants or any sort of privilege uh, a group within uh, ethnic and racial groups. What really needs to happen is we need to think about, well, who is affirmative action serving and what are other ways to think about leveling the playing field that might be more appropriate and more helpful? Okay, great. So, so coming back, um, switching gears, but coming back a little bit to distinctions um, within this big category of Latino Jews uh, or Jutinos. Um, we have a few people asking about attitudes towards race among Latino Jews. So is there a certain kind of anti-dark skin or anti-Black racism that is um, endemic in the society of origin or among their particular cultures that they're bringing with them mm -hmm. and that then kind of intersects or overlaps or interacts with the kinds mm -hmm. of racism that, that they encounter in the US? And can you talk about that? Sure. Um, so I think that uh, th this idea of intersection and intersectionality is very important. Um, particularly in Latin America, where race and class are very hard to untangle. Um, so we know that in Latin America, sort of money whitens in a way, um, and uh, and and these folks bring that with them. Um, and and there's also a lot of use of veiled language. Um, so oftentimes to talk about people that are not as prepared 
is kind of language for they're not as educated, which is actually language for they're dark skinned. Um, and, and, and this is, and this is, th this happens all across Latin America, where it, again, the, the um, social class, it's, it's okay to talk about social class. Um, it's not necessarily okay to talk about race, but race is often, I mean, social class is often a substitute to talk about race. Um, and we come to the United States and it's actually, we pretend class doesn't really exist in those sort of larger scheme of things. We talk about how people move from class, how upward mobility is possible. Jews love to talk about how we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. Um, and, uh, and that's simply not only not true, um, what, what, what ends up happening is that we talk so much about race without actually talking about the intersection of class and race, um, which, which again, is very difficult to disentangle. But I think one of the important things to note here is the myths that we as a, we uh, you know, sort of American Jews um, and really the grandchildren of, America, of, of, of the first large wave of immigrants tell ourselves, right, that, that we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps and we are here because our grandparents worked very hard. I mean, you know, I wasn't born here, but you know, in general. Um, and and how, how dangerous that myth is. I, I'm not sure I exactly answered your question, but I think. Thank you, yeah. Um, do you find um, the concepts of passing or code switching to be useful, yes. helpful for thinking about these really complicated overlapping. Absolutely. I love the idea, not just the idea, but the notion of code switching. And I'm just gonna make a, 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 a plug here for, um, for a comedian named Sarah Jones. I don't know if any of you have ever seen her. She's amazing. And, um, and, and what she does is that she uh, has these, she portrays, uh, uh, women from different ethnic and racial backgrounds. And she does it so well that she's a black woman and that you stop, you, you no longer see her phenotype, right? What she looks like, her physical characteristics because her body movements and her language and what she, the way she's speaking and her, her um, and sort of all of, all of her presentation is really what you see. So there's this idea that absolutely we code switch all the time and Latino Jews are really good at doing this. And I notice it in my kids when they talk Spanish, they're different, right? They're different people, their voice is softer. They, um, they talk, they have different modalities, right? How we present ourselves in English is very, very different. And I always say that immigrants are sort of the best students of culture because we want so much to fit in that we really, we really look at how, well, how am I supposed to, how will they, how will they know that I'm an insider? And I always tell the story about when I, I said I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, but I actually, we were, I, 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 when we first moved here, we lived in a town outside of Boston where that was primarily, um, Irish Catholic and um, an Italian with a very strong Boston accent. And my brother and I learned very, very quickly to talk English with a really strong accent, which the moment I moved to Newton, I no longer had because in Boston, having this accent is, is, a, is a symbol of your class, right? This is how you signal class. Um, and my mother decided to move us from Boston because she said, the minute you came home and said, ma, the teacher, and she, and she had no idea. I said, ma, the teacher, she had no idea what we were saying. She said, that's it. I can't, we can't live here anymore because I can't understand you. But I think that this is one of the ways that we code switch. And I still do this if I go to Boston, right? I will talk to somebody in a Boston accent if I hear they have a Boston accent, because that's how I gain insider status. Right, and we all do it to some extent in one way or another, right? But when you have Absolutely. dueling dual identities, it really becomes stark. Um, I, yeah. I know we're down to like one more minute. I want to try to squeeze one more one more question in, um, which is about um, whether um, you have heard from Latino Jewish immigrants that they have felt an obstacle to being accepted 
within the Jewish communities in the United States. So a lot of what you talked about um, in the talk in general mm -hmm. was about incorporation to the United States in general and the, the immigrant experience. But you started out with the, with these anecdotes of being seen as not Jewish in Jewish context, mm -hmm. right? So is that is there is there a, a distinct sense among Jutinos that that um, that it's hard to integrate into American Judaism? Absolutely, and part of it is. So I, I like to think of it as sort of internal as well as external, right? How they feel like their experience is different and doesn't sort of, I would say, jive with the larger American Jewish experience, but also how, again, like that first quote, well, when people say to you, well, what, are, are you're Jewish? There are Jews in Mexico, there are Jews in Venezuela. Um, and, but one of the, the larger things I think happens is that it doesn't, it's, it happens much more when there's a large concentration and we know this in general, right? So if, if, if people feel like their town's getting taken over, that's when you start to see this sort of like anti-immigrant, anti-xenophobia. And that's what's been happening in South Florida, for example. So we have a lot of American Jews that say, well, I don't wanna send my kid to that Jewish day school because you know they're all Spanish and my kid's not gonna understand. It's a sort of veiled language, well, you know, it's sort of cultural racism. Well, it's not that I don't, I'm, I don't wanna be with Latinos, but you know, they all speak Spanish and I don't really, I, I'm not gonna fit in or I don't understand them, or um, you know, these sorts of ideas of, of, of them being othered um, absolutely happen, but primarily in areas where there's a large influx of Latino Jews. Okay, well, I, I wish we could talk all afternoon, but I know we're a minute past, so. So uh, let me thank you, Professor Lomanik, for sharing your expertise and your time with us and for engaging us in conversation. And thanks to you, Anne, as well, for the conversation. Um, I want to remind everyone that we are meeting next week and our unit uh, exploring the diversity within the Jewish world continues uh, with Professor Judith Weisenfeld of Princeton talking about 20th century Ethiopian Hebrew congregations in Harlem. So we'll be looking at intersections of black and Jewish identities next week. Again, thank you so much, Professor Lamanek. Uh, thank and uh, thanks everyone for joining us.